Welcome back to the second part of our visit to the Iron Age in this uh, our annual Brooktoberfest um, session. The, uh, our second speaker today is Ellie Graham. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Ellie, to briefly introduce yourself. Um, the title of Ellie's talk, as I said before, is A Slice Through Time a trio of erading Shetland Brocks. And just before I hand over Ellie, just to repeat the housekeeping from earlier, can I ask you to make sure that you're muted, folks, and you may well want to put your video off as well. And just to indicate that we'll be recording this talk to make it available for, uh, for future use. Okay, uh, Ellie, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to um, the organisers for inviting me to, to talk today, because I know it's a bit different being uh, up in Shetland rather than the Orkney focus. Um, so I'm currently a PhD student at Aberdeen, where I'm looking at coastal erosion impacts on archaeological sites and flying drones to survey them and assess damage. Um, but I'm mostly speaking today in my former capacity, uh, which is at the Scape Trust. Um, where I was based at the University of St Andrews, again looking at coastal erosion impacts on coastal heritage sites and working with volunteers and local communities to survey and investigate them. So I will share my screen now and uh, hopefully... Can everybody see that? I'm not hearing anything, so I hope that's a yes. Um, so I, I really am talking today um, on behalf of the project partners, which were my former colleagues at SCAPE um, and at Archaeology Shetland. So this is uh, Joanna Hambly, who I worked with at SCAPE, um, but it's also the friends and members of Archaeology Shetland and local community members, because without these people, the projects wouldn't have happened. So, so the results I'm presenting today really belong to them. So uh, to give a little bit of background, uh, SCAPE ran a project called SHARP, Scotland's Coastal Heritage at Risk Project, um, from 2012 to 2016. And that worked with local communities to record eroding sites, get an up to date record of their current condition, create a prioritised list of those sites um, which were most vulnerable to erosion, the most archaeologically significant, and also the ones that were most valued by local people. Uh, you can read the full results on the on the SCAPE website there. Perhaps unsurprisingly, um, it was the archipelagos of um, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles, which had the highest concentrations of those sites, really reflecting their sea level rise. Um, the geomorphology of the coastlines, as well as their archaeological heritage. And as part of SHARP, um, we also carried out practical projects at some of those highest priority sites that were nominated by local volunteers for action and investigation. And I'm specifically talking today about um, Shetland Brock sites, uh, the first two of which were highlighted by local volunteers um, for practical investigation as part of the SHARP project. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Chanarwick, uh, down on the south mainland of Shetland on the east coast. It's in a southeast facing bay, so it's um, generally very, very sheltered. It's actually known locally as the Windless Bay because it's so sheltered from the prevailing weather. However, um, in winter 2013-2014, uh, you might remember there was a series of very big storms. There was a lot of flooding further south. But um, it also caused a lot of erosion, um, particularly in this area of Shetland and in Chanowick Bay particularly. And following those storms, the, uh, the landowner actually found a human jawbone on the beach, I think much to his horror. So um, following that, there was a rapid excavation and recording um, under the Human Remains uh, Call of Contract commissioned by Historic Scotland. Um, and that uncovered uh, an entire uh, male skeleton. It was very awkwardly squashed into this grave. So I hope you can see he's, um, he's he's too big for it. And that's the skull being raised like that is one of the reasons that the, the jawbone was the part that was first eroded out. Um, and his, his leg is squashed in as well. So he was sort of awkwardly squashed into this grave that was too small for him um, at the foot of the coast edge in, in this uh, Chanarwick Bay. Um, so they undertook radiocarbon dating of the bones, of course, um, and the results revealed that he was actually buried between uh, 1760 and 1820. So you're probably thinking well, that's nothing to do with a broch. Um, but we think what happened was that the washed up bodies of drowned and shipwrecked sailors um, were quite commonly, uh, unfortunately, uh, found along these sorts of coasts. And they probably quite often would not have been in a particularly pleasant state. They were often just 
sort of wrapped up in a piece of sailcloth and buried as rapidly and uh, uh, close to the site of their uh, finding as possible. So we think that's probably what happened uh, to this individual. Um, however, entirely fortuitously, um, the work also revealed um, a mass of other archaeological features in the coast edge behind the skeleton. So the sea had exposed, as you see here, really quite a, quite a large structure. Um, Samantha Dennis, the local archaeologist who'd done the human remains work, um, she spotted and did some rapid recording here and really highlighted that there was more to the to the story here. So as you can see, it was just sort of a, a jumble of uh, features eroding out of the coast edge, a lot of masonry, those lovely brightly coloured layers of um, clay, uh, as, as well as the sort of enigmatic little corbelled cell coming out of the of the coast edge. So that really drew archaeological attention to the site for the first time. So after a lot of looking and discussion, um, we undertook a project to investigate the site with Archaeology Shetland. So in summer 2015, we carried out just a very sort of non-intrusive um, section cleaning and recording project um, on the features that were eroding out of the coast edge there. Because the, the thing was, it could be quite a, a sort of small scale intervention because the nature of the coast edge here and the nature of the erosion really did give us just a slice through the middle of this structure. So we had a, a fantastic section without really having to do very much digging at all, which was great. Uh, even nicer, uh, there was this layer of till um, at the base of the section, um, which hadn't been eroded as far back as the as the higher up sediments, which gave us this fantastic step for us to to stand on to to access the the features in the section. So that's what you're seeing the volunteers standing on here. It's the natural till. It actually looks like an archaeological feature because it's got that lovely sort of red colour and even flecks of manganese, which which look like charcoal. But it is in fact just just glacial till and a convenient step for us to stand on, which was nice. So as we sort of cut back and straightened up the section, the sort of jumble of stones, of course, resolved itself into uh, this, this monumental structure. So um, on the south side, we had this, this fantastic uh, five metre wide wall. Um, we also had uh, layers of uh, hearths and floor surfaces in the, in the centre of the structure. Um, so we sort of realised fairly early on that we might be looking at an unrecorded broch with possibly with additional structures that have been inserted into it. So running through what we have in, this, in the section here, um, we had a, a lovely layer of clean windblown sand which had formed on top of the till onto which that structure had been built. So they had literally built on sand. Uh, that stone on the on the south side of the of the section was this sort of massive um, slightly arcing uh, stone wall, which was constructed right onto that wind blown sand layer. Um, the outer face was made of these lovely huge blocks of Channerwick granite, which is a very bright white um, coarse grained uh, granite that's uh, very local, uh, but very locally available. And it has uh, large inclusions of quartz and mica. So it would have been this sparkling white tower, you know, it would have sparkled in the sun. So we had the inner and outer faces of the wall. It was about five metres wide and we had sort of hints potentially of an intramural passageway or something in the middle there. Um, but if you're wondering why that middle section of that wall hasn't been cleaned, um, it wasn't just that we were lazy. Um, it was because of this little guy. We had an unfledged uh, fulmer chick uh, nesting on the stones of the, of, of the broch wall. So of course we didn't want to disturb them and we didn't particularly want to spend like a week and a half covered in fulmer vomit. So um, we just left that, that part of the uh, section undisturbed. Um, so we were never able to determine really whether or not there, there was a passage there. Um, honestly, for anyone who walks the coast regularly, Fulmers always seem to nest in archaeological features. They love sitting on the stones that are popping out of section. So if you find fulmers, chances are they're on an archaeological site. They seem to love it, but it, it does make life difficult for us to get up close to the section quite often. Um, so you're probably thinking, yeah, that's that's great, but where's where's the other wall? Um, well, it, it was here originally. You can actually see the, the cut there where it's been robbed out at some point between the medieval period and the 19th century. They just completely dug out the wall, so there's hardly anything left on that side. But it, it, it was there. You can see the cut um, and you can see the, the darker fill there of the soil that's that's filling it. Um, and in the centre of the broch, 
we had uh, that lovely corbelled structure that Samantha had had first spotted. And uh, that turned out to be a really beautifully constructed well. And it had these small, perfectly formed steps going down into it. And they just kept going and going and going. Uh, and there was still, when I was standing in there recording it, we had to stop because we physically couldn't move down there anymore. But there was still at least another meter of deposits down there. So it was a, it was a huge um, structure, but we think they were probably sending children down there because it was just so tight um, and so, um, so, so small down there with those very small, small steps. Um, it did because they built into sand. There was actually a hint of a rebuild on the on the south side, which you can see um, above. Simon's head there in the yellow hard hat. We did have a stonemason on site, by the way, who took a close look at it and did assure us it was safe to be in and safe to be down there. So we were looking after our health and safety, by the way. Um, so they had at some point um, had to rebuild it in the past um, on that on that south side. Um, but the well had fairly early in its history, deliberately and very rapidly been backfilled with layers of clean beach sand, uh, soft clay and charcoal. There's a lot of um, material in there that we think were actually sort of the occupation deposits um, associated with the Brock phase. Um, unfortunately, we didn't actually have any in situ occupation. Um, there were no floors, no hearths actually uh, from that from that period. Um, but we think because the well had been backfilled in that one single deliberate event, uh, that might actually have been the domestic waste of that of that period. So we did a lot of uh, paleoenvironmental analysis and it looks like they were using heather as a fuel. Um, so either peat or turf. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, Paul's not still here to, to have a chat about that, actually. Um, but we also found that uh, there's probably an, ar an arable regime. There was naked barley in there um, and evidence for cereal processing as well. Uh, that there was uh, mammal bone, fish bone, um, cetacean bone as well. So probably food waste. And we had iron slag and magnetic residue in there. So it, we think that they might actually have been working iron there and potentially using peat as a fuel, uh, which uh, which is quite cool and sort of intersects nicely with uh, with what Paul's just been been talking about. So we got radiocarbon dates from uh, some of those fills and they were uh, mid sixth century BC to early fourth century BC. So that probably is dating the primary phase of the Brox occupation. So uh, a few hundred years later, um, it stopped being a broch. They uh, inserted um, internal piers and remodeled it into a wheelhouse structure. So I'm sure you're familiar with those from places like Jarlshof and uh, Skatnes being some of the most famous examples. But basically, they built radial dry stone piers against the inside face of the broch wall to create a floor plan that resembles a wheel, uh, with the outer wall being the sort of rim and the projecting internal piers being the, the spokes. It was really quite common in Shetland brochs. Scatness, of course, is one of the best known examples, but there are others around near, nearby Channerwick. So this is the South Pier uh, built against the surviving South Arc of the Broch Wall. Uh, we think the Broch Wall at that point might also have been reduced in height um, because we, we see other sites quite often that stone is then used to build uh, other structures nearby, but we, we didn't have any trace of that at Channerwick. Uh, the initial uh, insertion of the pier was then remodelled. You see, you've got the sort of orthostatic um, insertion against the, the end of the pier as well. So there's a, there's a subsequent phase of remodelling that goes on. Um, you can see that that pink layer just, just under, the, under the stone of the pier there with the Kubiena tin through it. Again, that's very similar to the material that we found in the well. So we think what they were doing, it's, it's not in situ, but they seem to have been uh, importing domestic waste and using it um, as part of the construction during this uh, remodeling phase. Um, so we, we think they're using that deliberately to sort of consolidate um, the foundation layer and as construction material when they were rebuilding the uh, south side of the well there. Um, so that's the that's the pier and in the center of the uh, structure just on the on the north side of the well, we had that those lovely layers of, of, of brightly coloured clay that uh, Sam had had first spotted, um, and unfortunately that had actually eroded out quite a lot more by the time we actually got there in in twenty fifteen. But we did have just the edges of the sort of central hearth of the wheelhouse phase, um, surrounded by sort of burnt floor type material, and again they were really rich in sort of occupation stuff. We had fish, beef, uh, mutton. Uh, whale and dolphin bones as well. So again, domestic waste, pottery, cobble grinders, uh, some lovely pierced stone pebbles that we think were probably uh, loom weights. 
But interestingly, um, next to the hearth and just uh, under the small black photo scale, you can see there that, that very black concentration um, is, a, is a small pit containing both slag and charcoal. Um, and that, of course, was, was very exciting because it shows that they were probably working or, or smelting iron here. Um, so if the, the, that hearth might actually also have been used as a small iron smelting furnace. Um, as well as that, again, we had a barley grain and um, arable cultivation uh, evidence with uh, weeds and things in there as well. And this is, again, slightly later, it's about 50 BC to 70 AD. So we've got a much, much later phase of, of occupation here. Again, they were using uh, peats and turves uh, as, as fuel. So it is really common in Shetland for um, brochs to be converted into wheelhouses. Uh, we see it at uh, Skatness and Leavenwick, which is really close by to, to Channerwick. Um, so here, though, what, what was quite interesting was the, the South Pier was inserted as a sort of freestanding structure, but the North Pier was actually dug differently. It was actually dug into, into a foundation trench. Um, and they were just occupying the area, the entirety of the area between those piers seems to have been their, their occupation area because there were floors and, and hearth deposits all the way across the section between those, those two piers. Um, so this is the structure as, as we saw it in section. Um, and this is the uh, section as, as we drew it. Now, I'm not expecting you to, to sort of look at that um, on, on there, but what you can see hopefully here is that we put in um, several profiles uh, for, for dating evidence because the unique thing about Channerwick really was that it had given us this slice all the way through to the earliest phases, the sort of pre brock phase, the earliest construction, and then all the way through to the um, to the wheelhouse occupation. So it, it, it was quite a unique opportunity because even some of the other very well investigated uh, brochs, they very rarely get that sort of opportunity um, to really look closely and, and date those, those layers, those, those sort of pre-broch and construction phases. Um, so as you can see, we, we took OSL samples, which are the ones that's highlighted in green here, as well as the more traditional radiocarbon dates, which are which are there in red. So for anyone who might not be aware, OSL is optically stimulated luminescence, and it's particularly applicable in sand, which was the other nice thing about Channerick. It's, um, it, it's, it's a great technique for dating sand, because what it does is it uh, can measure the time since a grain of quartz or a grain of feldspar um, how long it's been since that was last exposed to light, so how long that's been buried for, which of course is very applicable um, to archaeological sites and particularly to uh, sandy sections like this one. Um, so we had both OSL profiles for the sort of uh, pre-construction phases and also the, the radiocarbon dates on charcoal, bone, um, grain, which are in the in the red there. So. Um, I'm not necessarily expecting you to sort of go through this this matrix in in great detail, but the again the nice thing about Channerick was to get that that fantastic series of um, pre brock dates. So just have a have a quick look at the matrix and the phasing. Um, so we had the dates from the sand that had accumulated on the till uh, prior to the brock being constructed, and it dated it to the fifth um, sixth century BC, which is a lot earlier than the traditional brock period uh, dates that you're getting from places like Dunvulan and Old Skatness. So we're sort of questioning potentially how, how early brochs were, were being built here. So we've got the construction of the outer broch wall and the well feature, but as I say, we don't actually have any in situ deposits associated with that, unfortunately. Um, Really, we think that yeah, the the sort of domestic material was was used um, to to backfill the well and us and us that construction material, um, and one of the reasons we we think that that might be the case potentially that that we just don't have that material in situ is because it has been suggested um, if any of you've read Ian Armit's book um, that Brock is actually the main sort of um, focal point for occupation was was on the first floor. Uh, so the, the domestic space and all the domestic waste would have been higher up and the ground floor was used more for for stock and for other sorts of activities um, so, so there simply wouldn't have been in situ domestic waste at that ground level that we're seeing um, so it, it could be that 
it, it simply was never there. They imported it as a building material and sort of foundation level when they were remodeling into the wheelhouse. And that wheelhouse phase would have then had a shift in focus where the living area domestic activities would have been focused at that ground level. So that could explain why we're, we're just not seeing anything in situ there. Uh, we then had the insertion of the piers and the occupation of the wheelhouse. Um, they then modified the piers again, so you saw they inserted that, that really nice orthostatic structure against the, um, against the interface of the South Pier. Um, but again, they, they did it differently. Um, the South Pier was uh, remodelled in a, in a different way to the North Pier for, for some reason. Um, and then there was a final phase of occupation associated with that, with that modified structure. And again, we've got a charred grain from the upper hearth materials. And that gave us again a later date of sort of 69 to uh, 220 AD. So we've got a nice, nice sort of phasing there. So we've got occupation continuing at least until the, the third century there. Uh, then on top of that, there's a period of abandonment. We had windblown sand on top of it, um, which again, with OSL, we were able to date to sort of uh, 3rd, 4th century AD. We think the, the structure had, had finally gone out of use. So we're looking at a really long period of time that this structure appears to have been in use for. And then, of course, the, the last thing on, on the site was that shipwreck burial, burial which um, we really we just simply don't have a relationship between that and the and the brock because it had been so uh, eroded out. All the fills in the upper part of the grave cut had been washed out by erosion, so it was only about it's only about twenty centimeters deep by the time Samantha got there. Um, but it, as I said, what happened was it was completely coincidentally inserted into the coast edge in that sort of eighteenth nineteenth century period just dug into the sort of shallow coast edge through the material that had slumped down in in front of the brock um, and they probably didn't even know the brock was there when they did it so it's completely unrelated to the site um, ironically but was so important to it in that it was that discovery that first drew archaeological attention to the area to reveal the sort of previously unsuspected brock so as i say we really did have this this unique opportunity that was presented to us by the erosion to investigate the, the base of the brock, the very earliest deposits at the construction levels, and really get, get a slice through the, the entire structure, all thanks to the erosion. And uh, it was thanks to the erosion, really, that, that we were there in the first place. Now, I've been calling it the brock uh, the whole way through, and of course, this is Brocktoberfest, but you could very well, and I wouldn't blame you, be thinking, yeah, there's only about like a metre and a half of it there. How can you be certain it was a brock? because we only have the foundation levels and the and the sort of ground floor. So how, how certain can we be that it was a broch? Because so many of those diagnostic features that make a broch a broch simply aren't there. The, the, the structure just, just hasn't survived to that height. So you don't have the, the height of the broch tower. You don't have so many of those features, the upper levels, you know, the um, scarcement law walls, scarce, scarcement ledge, the, the hollow walls, the intramural gal galleries and staircases. Um, and also, you know, we, we don't have any sign of an, of an entrance or, or guard cells or anything. So how certain can we really be that this is actually a broch? Um, but when, when you look at the width of the thing, the width of that south wall, um, the sort of visible diameter of the structure and extrapolating where the, the other side of the wall was, they are all quite, quite indicative of a broch. And although we only have that, that bottom sort of one and a half metres, um, it does appear to have that sort of inward batter that, that you get with a broch wall. Um, and so given the scale of what we're seeing, it, it, it looks like, like a broch, the, the scale of the thing fits. And you can actually plonk the plan, a plan of Musa on top of it, and it fits. So it looks very much like a broch tower on the scale of something like, like Musa. Um, and we can also sort of imagine it in the landscape. Um, so this is a drone model of the Bay of Chanerwick, and I've sort of plonked the Tower of Musa in there. Um, and it, it is in a sort of very traditionally brocky sort of location. Um, so you can imagine it here, but of course, because it was built of the um, local uh, Chanerwick granite, that, that white granite with the quartz, uh, the, and uh, mica, it would have sparkled in the sun. So although it was a very locally available and convenient stone, we do wonder whether it was selected deliberately sort of for aesthetic reasons, because it, it would have been this, this monumental tower sparkling in the sun. Um, 
so we don't know when it um, went out of use and was abandoned. Obviously, it, it doesn't look like this now, unfortunately. It, it, it's uh, it's no Musa what, what we have there. But it would have remained a visible landscape feature, we think, probably until the, the 19th century, because people knew knew it was there. They were they were robbing it out on that on that north side. And, and that north wall, as I said, there's there's basically just the tiniest sliver of uh, foundation left. So it was quarried for building stone for the township of Channerwick. Um, but so even after it had been abandoned, it sort of still had this this afterlife as, and it sort of lived on in the in the township and the and the buildings of Channerwick um, right up to the uh, 19th century. So this 19th century um, chapel was probably one of the last buildings that was built of stone from the broch. And even it now, as you can see, is is being eroded away and is literally falling down the coastal slope. So, as I said, the at, at Channerwick, it really was Coastal, coastal erosion, which opened this window of, of opportunity for us to look at the Broch from the earliest construction phases right through to that final act of sort of stone quarrying in the in the 19th century. Um, as, as far as we know, it's it's the only Broch well I think that's um, been discovered in Shetland. But because of that sort of unique opportunity of, of looking at the at the basal layers, um, who knows what's buried under under other Broch floors in in, in Shetland. Um, the projects had had an afterlife too, in the in the same way the the walls of the Broch had an afterlife in the township of Channerwick, because local volunteers are still visiting and, and monitoring the section. And um, one of them actually got this this lovely uh, painted pebble, uh, which is a very rare and exciting find, of course, out of one of the fills associated with that rebuild of the well. So a deposit that was dated to the sort of fifth sixth century BC. So the the, the 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 sort of project lives on in in that sense as well. Um, however, without any more uh, southeasterly storms, uh, the entire coast edge is really sort of slumping and stabilising and revegetating. So over the seven years since we were there, the site's gone from looking like this to uh, looking like this. This is when I was there uh, just a few weeks ago in August this year. So in many ways, it's, it's really great news that that slumping and revegetating um, slope is actually protecting the, the archaeological deposits. Um, although if you can see the, the black plastic there in the till, that's actually the edge of the well. So the till has eroded back a little bit and the well is sort of just about to be breached. And that uh, south pier on the on the south side, so that's the that's the well again there. The sediment's actually been eroded out from behind it. So that's almost now a completely freestanding structure. So another southeasterly um, is, is is probably going to do some some serious damage there and completely destroy that pier. I would have thought. So it is stabilising, but it, it does remain very very vulnerable. And that's really where my sort of current PhD research comes in because I'm looking at state coastal erosion impacts and vulnerability. So. Um, what I do is I fly drones, um, create 3D models of the landscape um, from a technique called structure from motion, which uh, builds 3D geometry just from a series of, of overlapping images to build a 3D digital model. So that creates a landscape model. And from that, I, I, I map the current position of the coastline. So this is my model from August of uh, Channerwick Bay. Uh, so we've got the coast edge there, but I've also mapped um, the historic coastline. So that's the coastline in 1882, uh, 1972, and then from aerial photos uh, from 2008, 2016, uh, 2014, uh, 2021, and then my model of the coast edge there. And you can see just just visually looking at that, just how much erosion there's there's been in in, in some areas, but it also allows us to sort of calculate um, coastal change across the bay and look at that sort of coastal vulnerability. So um, looking at that between just 1972 and 2022, just, just in that 50 years, we've lost very nearly 14 metres of coastline um, in, in some places. I haven't shown you the um, mapping of from the 1882 because the coast edge is just so badly mapped on the first edition ordnance survey map. It's actually not, not very useful, but just looking at this 50 year slice, um, we're losing up to up to 14 metres in some areas. And it is all concentrated exactly where the Broch is, weirdly enough, just on that uh, north north corner of the bay. And again, if, if you do the same exercise just between 2008 and 2022, 
again, you're losing 10 metres, but only really in that specific area where the Brock is. So there was something about that particular part of the coast edge where they built the Brock that seems to be most vulnerable to um, to that, that set of conditions, which was probably the, the series of storms in 2013, 2014, that really hit this bay, which normally is, is, is so, so sheltered. Um, and it really was, it does appear to have been that particular set of storms that, that did the damage there. So we will know in future if there are uh, storms that have a, a similar set of conditions, we'll know to go down there and immediately check, check the Brock at Channerwick. So we, we sort of have this early warning forecast now um, to uh, monitor that site under these under these specific conditions. So the um, second site I'm going to talk about is a very, very different broch. It's uh, up in uh, Fetlar, which is one of the North Isles of Shetland. Um, and it's on the on the northwest coast of, of, of Fetlar, facing across to Yale. So really, again, what should be a, a very, very sheltered coastline so it was uh, 2019, uh, SCAPE uh, volunteers from Archaeology Shetland and from the local community did, again, survey, uh, section cleaning, recording and sampling. Um, however, it looks completely different and not probably what you'd expect because there's no broch anymore at Fettler. It's been completely destroyed by erosion. You've got just the very edge, the very remnant of the broch mound, but the broch mound and the tower itself have both been lost to erosion um, in the past. Um, so what we were interested in here was actually the, the defences, the um, outer bank uh, and inner bank and ditch, um, which again had, we had a window, a sort of slice through them presented to us by um, coastal erosion. And what was nice about them is we had this opportunity in the deposits in there um, to address all sorts of research questions about the chronology of brochs and about the, the sort of broch environment again an opportunity presented to us by erosion so even though there's no broch there anymore and it's perhaps not the most charismatic it's certainly no musa um, we we do have this archaeologically very interesting uh, opportunity to look at these um, quite exciting archaeologically exciting uh, sediments uh, in there so um, we had four sections across there the outer bank and ditch, the inner bank and ditch, and across the, the Broch Mound as well. And it was, again, very um, low impact, just uh, cleaning the section, uh, recording them and, and taking some very small samples. But if you look at the at the section that we have there, um, you can see you've got this, this lovely archaeologically set section that's been, been cut by erosion through the bank, uh, which is preserving the uh, soils, the, the ground surface that was around before the Broch was built. But even more excitingly, across the ditch, you've got uh, anaerobic uh, waterlogged sediments. So the organic preservation there is fantastic. Um, so again, it was sort of very, very minimal intervention. I think we were only there for about four days and the weather was atrocious. Um, so it was it was quite a quite low impact and um, quite, quite quick and easy to get some some really sort of archaeologically exciting samples. So again, you can see there you've got this lovely section across the, the rampart, the outer rampart, and this beautifully preserved Iron Age pre broch soil surface there. Um, so again, what, when you record it, you can also see you've probably got uh, the remains of slumped revetment material. So the, the banks originally were, were probably stone faced. And you've got this, this wonderful ditch, which is really shallow, actually. It only goes, it doesn't cut into the bedrock, it just goes down to the bedrock. But the base of the ditch there, you can see those, those lovely grey colours is completely waterlogged. Um, so fantastic preservation material for organics. Uh, so we had um, wood, we had vegetation, what appeared to be like a humified vegetation layer, which was probably formed in situ at the base of the ditch. So we had these, this in situ Iron Age vegetation layer that, that, that looked like moss, actually. And that main fill there, as you can see, had huge chunks of, of stone in there, some of which was probably in situ revetment from the facing of the of the ditch. But some of it um, appears to have, have slumped in and actually brought uh, organic material with it because you had sort of chunks of rip classed uh, organic material and turf and things. So it looks like what had happened was the tower had collapsed fairly suddenly and tumbled into the softer sediments of the of the ditch there, um, bringing associated vegetation with it. Um, 
So we had fantastic preservation layer, which when we cleaned up, you can see you've got that lovely dark layer of preserved plant material and wood. Uh, again, you'd some find we had very little pottery from here, I think probably because the soil was so peaty, but we did have um, we did a hammer stone up there. So you can see at the top of the, of the uh, ditch fill. Um, and really what we were excited about was that, that those lovely vegetation layers, that sort of in situ prehistoric uh, vegetation. And uh, we were also able to see quite a lot of probably what's the remains of in situ stone revetments for the, uh, for the ditch and bank. And again, we took heaps of samples. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the results of those to present you with because, of course, this was done in autumn 2019 and uh, COVID and lockdown uh, has stopped us actually getting samples analysed yet. Um, but we'll keep you posted. We will get them, get them looked at and get some answers. But we didn't even have to do just the microscopic work um, because this was the scale of the organic preservation in there. We had a essentially a wooden stake of, of, of some sort, whether they were vampire hunting and fettling, I don't know, but we had this this lovely, beautifully preserved wooden stake there just coming out of the of the lower fills of the ditch. Uh, we also did um, take a look at the remnant of the Brock Mound. We, we put a little section through that. It was almost impossible to clean because it was so stony, just, just the remains of that Brock Mound. But again, we had a, a, a layer of soil underneath that, which was the uh, old ground surface that they, they built the Brock on. Um, in the in the Iron Age. Um, so from what we could see in the in the sections, um, as well as all, all that organic materials, I've said well, there's so much stone in there, some of which would have come from the tumble of the of, of the Brock Tower when it collapsed. But we also think we are looking at revetment uh, walling of the of the bank and ditch. So we can sort of infer the original profiles from that and from the amount of slumped material in those in those ditch fills. And probably it, it would have been a far more impressive um, and substantial structure than you can see now in the in the landscape there. It would have been this uh, very conspicuous um, sort of uh, stone structure. It would have been it, it, the banks and ditches would have looked like stone walls around this this lovely Brock Tower originally. Um, so we were able to get a, a much better understanding of perhaps what the monument might have looked like prior to all of this erosion. But the um, the second part of the project that we were looking at here again was looking at coastal change analysis, very similar to what we're, we're doing at Channerwick. So we were lucky in that the Royal Commission in the 1930s had drawn this wonderful plan of the of the structure as it, as it had been then. You can see there there was a little bit more of the of, of the Brock surviving at that point when they were there um, just under a um, hundred years ago. So we were able to use that um, to, to get a sense of how much had been lost uh, between then and when we were there in 2019. And again, um, I flew the drone. So we had a, an ortho photo from the uh, from the drone photos which were used to build a 3D digital landscape model. Uh, from that we were able to build a digital elevation model showing the, the plan of the earthworks as well as the location of the coast edge and we were able to build a, a modern hashard plan to, to compare directly with the 1934 one and we used that to uh, map the current position of the vegetation edge there and looking just at the difference on the monument between 1934 and 2019, we lost up to very nearly five metres um, across the monument and the and the banks and ditches uh, in that period, and about three to three and a half metres of the of, of the Brock Mount. So that's 85 years, and you're losing nearly nearly five metres of those soft, um, very vulnerable, very low lying, but extremely archaeologically and paleo environmentally rich deposits in those ditches. Um, they are incredibly vulnerable to these coastal processes. Um, so we did a similar uh, survey uh, for the landscape around the monument uh, using 25 centimetre resolution aerial photos. Um, and again, what, what that showed was in that period from uh, the first edition being mapped in 1878 and our drone survey and mapping in, in 2019, interestingly, Again, the main area of erosion on this coastline was exactly on the Brock. The rest of the coastline is really relatively stable, um, but it is on the site of the Brock that we're seeing um, that we're seeing the most erosion, which is 
quite interesting, if not a little bit worrying. Um, but we were also able to use that to look at potential future impacts and vulnerability, particularly of those archaeologically rich deposits in the ditch. And looking at that, um, this is how much we could be standing to lose to erosion just at those rates. So that's just continuing the same trends. That's not even building in sea level rise and increased storminess from, from climate change. This, this is how much of the monument we could stand to lose by 2050 and 2100. Uh, which is which is really quite quite worrying for particularly those um, organic rich waterlogged deposits. Um, so the second part of what we wanted to do with this was also sort of extrapolate that backwards by 2000 years to when the Brock was occupied. What was the landscape like? You know, can can those rates of erosion um, explain how how a monument on this scale has has gone, has just sort of vanished, been, been eroded away. So does sort of incremental erosion account for that or would there have to have been some sort of enormous event like a, a potential tsunami, which I know colleagues are looking at evidence of around this part of Shetland. So at those rates, um, the coastline we calculated could have been between 58 and 112 metres to the west of where it, it currently is. Um, so that's that's a huge amount of erosion we, we, that could have um, taken place on this on the site. Uh, we also plotted that on a marine digital model, and those um, coastlines would would put them on the sort of minus two meter contour. Um, so it's very shallow water um, over just a subtidal rock platform. So just a couple of meters of erosion of that sort of superficial deposit um, could make that sort of coastline from two thousand years ago very very feasible. And similarly, looking at um, recent sea level rise um, models for this part of Shetland, it is it, it does look like the sea level in this part of Shetland was between a metre and three metres lower 2000 years ago, which again puts the coastline between 50 metres and 73 metres um, seaward of its of its current position. Um, so if we plot all of those together for this coastline, um, you can see the, the red is the extent of the um, actual scheduled area for the for the broch. The orange is the sort of extrapolated size of the broch um, that's sort of inferred from similar examples around uh, Fettler. The uh, different shades of blue are the are the subsurface contours, and the two shades of green are the two different positions of the coastline that those recent glacial um, sea level models where they would put the coastline 2000 years ago. So when this broch was, was likely occupied. Um, and the white rectangle is where our calculations put the put the coastline, just extrapolating those erosion rates that we've seen, extrapolating those those backwards. And you can see they sort of broadly more or less all agree with each other um, in terms of the position of where the coastline was when Snabroch was occupied. So this does seem like a technique that we can use to sort of reconstruct the Iron Age landscape. And it does show that just that sort of relative sea level rise and wave action alone could actually explain the erosion and complete destruction of a monument of this scale in this sort of low lying landscape. Um, so you don't even need an enormous tsunami type event to to account for the loss of this of this structure. Um, and that's that is the sort of scale of the threat that we're looking at all over the coastline in terms of what those actions alone can do and how much we can lose to erosion and then how much worse it might be getting with sea level rise accelerating and um, potentially more, more storminess as well. So um, you are probably looking at the time now thinking she's going to speak about three brochs. Uh, we've done two, but uh, it's getting on to lunchtime. Uh, how much longer is this going to take? Uh, well, don't worry about it, because the last one I don't actually have a huge amount to say about yet. Um, this is the last one. It's Fuglaness Broch, um, which is on the northeast coast of Shetland mainland um, facing uh, Yell. So again, it's a very, very sheltered uh, stretch of coastline on the sound. And as I say, I don't actually have much to say about it yet, um, except that it was another site that was highlighted by Scape as a high priority. And I intend to do similar coastal change analysis as I've discussed at Fettler and at Chanowick. But I haven't actually done any of that yet, um, but I have flown my drone. So you can, so I, I, I have the data to build these models. I just haven't got around to actually making them yet. Um, but I have decided to include it really because um, it's, it, it's a nice site, but 
this sort of gives you a, a sense of what snab rock might have looked like had it not been lost to erosion. Um, so this is, uh, you can see the sort of central rock mound there and the and the external defences. So this is probably how how SNA would have would have fitted in the landscape if it hadn't been completely lost to erosion. However, this this one is also eroding, and again we have um, a wonderful plan drawn by the Royal Commission. Actually, the the same surveyor, um, just a. a, a <coughs> I think a year earlier, he was he was up there again doing his his wonderful plans, which we know from Fettler from the Snap Rock plans are very accurate. So I'm going to use that uh, compared with my drone model from August again to do a similar exercise and calculate how much of this rock is is being lost to erosion, because you can see it is it is being eroded. So that's the probably the position of the Brock mound in there. Those those two holes um, aren't actually due to erosion. I think that was antiquarian fertling. Um, but again, here we have this um, similar profile through the ditches and, and banks. So it'd be really great if we can to do a sort of small scale intervention there, get some more data um, from these from these sort of preserved Iron Age soils and potentially preserved uh, ditch fills, because again, it's a very waterlogged uh, sediment at the base of the ditch. So great organic preservation. Um, and again, even on a site like this. So this is very similar to Fettler. It's sort of low lying um, rock platform, not a huge amount of superficial sediments, very, very sheltered coastline. But again, the arc of the Brock is, is being lost to erosion. It started to nibble um, through those walls. And then once erosion actually reaches those, those internal holes, it, it's going to cause a lot of damage. So even a site like this that um, is currently still standing is is very very vulnerable, um, but I thought I would include it really just to give you a sense of what what snab rock might have been had it had it not already been completely lost to those processes of coastal erosion. But hopefully, what I've um, shown is that erosion, although very damaging and a huge threat, isn't always a bad thing because it can present us with these opportunities and these sort of unique slices, both through structures like Chanarwick, but also through these archaeologically very exciting. Um, deposits that will hopefully tell us a huge amount about the landscape of a prehistoric Iron Age Shetland. So um, that's me and uh, very happy to take questions. I'd just like to finish by saying thank you and a huge thank you particularly to SCAPE and to Archaeology Shetland and all the volunteers who've helped out on those projects because as, as I said these results really do belong to belong to them. So thank you. Thank you, Ellie, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, can I invite our audience to um, yes. indicate questions in the chat box, please, oh, yeah. for uh, for Ellie? Yes. Um, the the what's I suppose most fascinating for us, Ellie, is the twin pronged approach. The uh, material information you're giving us and extending our understanding of brochs and their afterlife and uh, the much more general application of uh, erosion in our coastal communities and obviously our island groups, Orkney, Shetland and of course the Western Isles too. Uh, so much of our archaeology is under threat, but as you say, ironically, uh, so, much, yeah. so much of it we will become aware of. Mark, could you put your iPhone off, please? Thanks. Um, so, so much of it will only become aware of when we, uh, when the erosion actually takes place. Very, very interesting. Uh, let's look and see if we have any questions for you uh, at this stage, Ellie. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we've got another one um, again from Mickey Van Litt. Uh, you mentioned you could see the pre-Brock soils that were well preserved in the second site. Yes. Can I remember what type of soil it was and what colour it was? Um, so the section at Fettler, um, we had essentially the bedrock. We had like a, a yellowish weathered glacial till again. And then we just had it was it was just a topsoil. Basically, it was like a loamy, uh, silty sort of topsoil that we had uh, preserved in that section that was just it was the ground surface and there was there was turf as well you could just about see the sort of that orangey color that you sometimes get with uh with turf you could see that on the um on the, the sort of preserved topsoil in the section just just quite a quite a thin layer and then above that and the ditches at um 
to Snabrock, we had essentially upcast glacial till from where they'd dug the ditches out. So it was essentially in situ weather till in situ uh, preserved topsoil just with organic material and, uh, and the remains of a, of a turf layer and then more glacial till, out of situ glacial till that had been redeposited on top of that to, to form the bank. Um, so I hope that answers that part of your question. Uh, did the other three sites possibly have similar soils? Um, in Channerwick, no. Uh, Channerwick was, um, was a sandy, very, very sandy. Um, with this sort of wonderful uh, Channerwick granite outcrop uh, just just adjacent. Um, that's, that is interesting about the uh, piling up of brighter coloured soils around the base to make the brock more visible. I think visibility in the landscape was, that was a massive thing. And certainly in Fettler, they were, they were using stone to make the ramparts um, obviously more sort of substantial. But again, visibility in the landscape would have, would have been a huge part of that and definitely in in Channerwick, they were using the that Channerwick granite, and it, I'm, I'm certain it must have been for visual effect as well. They actually left uh, in situ uh, construction debris on the on the south side of the of, of the Brock wall. So, you know, I mean, th they weren't sort of nice, tidy builders tidying up after themselves. They presumably deliberately left it there again, possibly in a in a similar way. Um, so I'm not certain we've seen that sort of use of brighter coloured soil, certainly the two that we've properly investigated, but they were definitely using what they had in the landscape to, to make them more visible. Um, and then we've got another one from Kieran. Would the build-up of vegetation begin to damage the structure due to rooting? Um, I mean, what we had in Fettler, um, it, was more, it, it looked mossy. So it's probably like quite quite thin turf, maybe some weeds and, and moss. So um, what we were seeing, the vegetation, I mean, theoretically, yes, it, it, it could do. And it did look certainly from the sort of tumble that we had in the ditch, it did look like when the structure collapsed, it was bringing um, vegetation in with it. Um, but this, the, the sorts of vegetation we were getting there wasn't the sort that, that would actually damage the structure, no. Um, they had enough problems with coastal erosion without the vegetation doing uh, doing more damage as well. Um, oh, and thank you, V. So you've sent. Oh, that's fantastic. That's so. Um, this is actually the Wikipedia entry for for the surveyor. I'll have to uh, I'll have to include him in my thesis because he's he was very very accurate. I mean, it was a, a very impressive what he and probably a small team. Uh, achieved with his plain table. So thank you for that. I will uh, I'll definitely include him in my in my thesis. Um, Kevin, do do you think there are any immediate benefits to the Brock economy um, by citing Brocks at the most vulnerable areas of the coastline as opposed to inevitable long term damage? That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, certainly. It is funny that those two brocks both appear to be in places where the erosion hits worse out of that that stretch of the coastline. Um, I mean, it sort of the things of um, visibility in the landscape, and of course, so often they are they're sighted next, sort of facing each other across a sound. Or um, in, in Fettler, you've got Snabrock, and then you've got a little um, offshore islet between Fettler and Yell. And there's a there's a brock there, and there's one on on the Yale side as well. So they were definitely um, looking at intervisibility and things um, in terms of immediate benefits to the, to the brock economy. That that's a, that's an interesting question, and it's something I, I think. Like the more I I look at this, the more I'm thinking I'm going to have to bring in something like that. I'm going to have to do some of that sort of work in my thesis as as well because they're. We know they're carefully selecting their sites, but it does appear to be having this this impact as well, which is really interesting. Um, Kath, have we found any midden material or animal remains in the sections we uncovered? Um, not in Snabroch. Um, there was it was very very little. It was almost a ceramic um, and no animal bone. I think largely because the soil is so peaty there. Very little we just survived apart from. The organics and the wet uh, wet deposits and the sort of stone artifacts, which are struck quartz and the the hammer stone. Um, 
at Channerwick, yes, we did. Uh, the soil preservation, because it was on sand, was was much better. And we, we did have some animal bone. Um, as I say, it was, I think mostly it was out of the deposits that were backfilling the well and uh, sort of around the, the base of the piers. There were, um, there was animal bone. Um, however, it was, I think it was a cow bone that we, that we tried to date out of the well and that failed because um, it was basically, it was almost mineralized. It was halfway to becoming a fossil. There wasn't enough um, organic material left in it to actually date. Um, so we we did get some calf, um, yeah, uh, but not, not actually a huge amount, perhaps not as much as you might have expected for a structure like Channerwick that was obviously occupied for probably about a thousand years. Was there any red deer? I would have to go back and check, but I don't think so. Um, I know that's your thing, Kath. I've been reading some of your articles. <laughs> um, keep in touch about it. I can I, I can go and check, but I'm pretty certain no. I think it was cow, uh, fish, and, and cetacean. But let me check and get back to you. I'm not seeing uh, any more questions, Ellie. Uh, as you will know, the exciting thing about these presentations is that they throw up questions that make us go back and make us think further about what we've uh, what we've discovered and, and thought through already and uh, and have implications for future work and future field work. Uh, and we certainly value that uh, in the presentations that we have. The, we're coming to the end of the um, this morning's session. Uh, we've had a glimpse once more of life in uh, Irony, Scotland uh, in very specific ways and in very uh, general ways, both of them uh, most exciting. Um, I'd like to thank our two speakers today, uh, specifically, first of all, Ellie, which I don't think I don't think I've thanked you properly for your presentation there, detailed, uh, lucid and um, making us wanting more, Ellie, I have to say. Thank you for that. And of course, thank you also to uh, Paul, Paul Jack, who spoke to us beforehand. We've had two very different presentations today uh, and also two very exciting presentations that I, I think have uh, extended our knowledge of, uh, of the Iron Age just that little bit. Ellie, as the erosion takes us uh, and takes away the uh, evidence for our Iron Age structures, it also ironically informs us further about them. Uh, and thank you for both these present presentations today from Paul uh, and Ellie. We have recorded both the sessions and they will be available uh, in the future through uh, our Orkney Archaeological Society website. Um, I would like to thank Kevin Kerr and Kayla Shepherd who set up today's meeting. Uh, it was Kevin that came up with the uh, interesting question about um, was there any implications for the uh, particular erosion because of wind direction and so on, and that will bear further thought. Uh, so thanks to these two, thanks to two speakers, and of course, folks, thank you for attending uh, our meeting today. We look forward to sharing uh, this work in the future and to seeing you again as audience for us. And for that, from rather a windy and damp Orkney, I say, Cheerio for now. Thank you. <laughs>